And now with bail bonds being pretty much uh, eradicated from our criminal justice system, we have the ROR, uh, the release on recognizance, for people who yep. know what that is. Does it get discouraging to like you lock somebody up on a Monday and they're out by Wednesday? Honestly, not really, man, because at the end of the day, I'm still doing my job. You know, I work 10 hour days and as long as I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, yeah. whenever I go to that call, if I catch the bad guy, he goes to jail. The court process is out of my, it's out of my pay grade, man. The judicial process is totally separate from the law enforcement process. Now, there are times, a handful of times, I should say, where I take people to jail and they get released the same night either because they have some type of medical condition or the, uh, the reason why I took them to jail does, does not seem right as to why they need to spend the night in jail. Usually when you take somebody to jail, you got 48 hours to be arraigned in front of a judge. Most of the time they get released the same night or the next morning, man. So honestly, it's not really discouraging. Um, I'm just doing my job at the end of the day, man. You know, it does get tiring when you've just arrested the same person. I'm like, dude, <laughs> already, man? But... There's really nothing I can do, man. That's up to the judicial system and, and the judges, man. So, kind of makes sense. No, yeah. yeah. So is that a mindset that you had to adopt or, or have you just always been under that? So some people do take it personally. And I've learned not to be personal with it, man, because I know some people cry about it where they're like, man, I just took this dude to jail. He tried to hit me or he tried to uh, cause great bodily harm and he's out already. It's like, dude, well, what are you expecting? Just because you're a police officer that he tried to hurt you, that he should be behind bars for, you know, X amount of time. It doesn't work that way, man. You know, sometimes the punishment doesn't fit the crime. If he's just right. trying to batter you, man, then he's Don't not going to be, he, the he's not gonna be in there for, you know, perfect two, three months, man. He's yeah. going to be there for, you know, 40, up to 48 hours. And it's up to the judge, depending on, his, on the individual individual's history, whether he gets to stay behind bars a lot longer. And nine times out of 10, they're going to get out pretty soon, man. Unless he just smokes somebody, then yeah, more than likely right. he's going to be behind bars for a while, man, until they get their hearing. But, you know, that's the judicial process, and a lot of people don't like how New Mexico operates. But, you know, that's just what it is, man. So, but separating that, though, do you feel like that would be advantageous to most law enforcement officers to be able to separate, like, yes, I am here to do my job. My job is to get them to the judicial system. Mm -hmm. But once I get there, once I get that person there, my law enforcement side is done. Like having that mentality you know, help out a lot of law enforcement here. Uh, I can, I can't answer for everybody else, man. But for me personally, yeah, I arrest them. I take them to jail. My job is done. The only time I have to kind of follow up with it is when I, whenever I have to go to court, you know, per that specific case. Like I just had court this morning for a shoplifter. I caught him in the act. Basically, we were investigating another shoplifting at Walmart. And we're in the security office. We're monitoring the cameras. And the asset protection team picked him up. It's like, this dude's very suspicious. He's wearing all black. He passed all points of sale, went into the guardian area. And I intercepted him, you know, as he, he was opening the door to go into the parking lot. So... He didn't show up, so there was a bench warrant for his, you know, for his arrest. But things like that, man, you know, I don't take it personally. You can't take it personally being a cop, man, because people talk shit. Yeah. So many people talk shit to me, man, and I don't know <laughs> if it's because, because the way I interact with them, man, or my face, man, I usually try to be chill. You know, I started a very good equilibrium, and I could either go down or up from there, man. I only react to how you're reacting to me. You know what I'm saying? So if you're giving me a hard time, I'm like, dude... Don't make it harder for yourself, man. You know, yeah. there's only so much you can do here, man. And usually if I know that you're going to start being a prick about it, I'm going to call for backup because I don't want to put myself in a situation where I'm going to get into a fight and I may have to smoke somebody or they're going to try to smoke me. So if the more numbers I have, depending on what this individual is doing, the better. That kind of makes sense, no, man? No, yeah. yeah. It's, that's, that is a scary part of the job, I'd imagine, is you're having these social interactions every day where you, I mean, you, you go in, you do your best to be neutral. But what's on the other side of that? Like if you're doing a traffic stop, what's on the other side of that car door? Or if you're having an interaction like at Walmart, you know, that person could take it zero to 100 almost yeah, immediately. Yeah, pretty much, man. And what I've told other officers and what I tell myself is that do not overreact to a situation. Kind of give them the benefit of the doubt. And what I mean by that is that have the advantage of the disadvantage. And what I mean by that is that start from zero and then just escalate from there. You know, base your actions as to how they're speaking with you and as to how they're reacting towards you, man. At that point, it gives you the justification as to why you took it from zero to 60 or in between. You know what I'm saying? So if you're being hostile towards me, man, I'm like, okay, I'm giving you the benefit of the doubt. I see that you're, you know, you're frustrated. You know, you may not have, you know, in good interaction with police in the past. 
but I'm just going to try to work it out with you, you know, using dialogue before we get into force, man. And that's where, you know, having the advantage of the disadvantages is that if I have to put you down, whether it's a forceful arrest or use some type of uh, a taser on you, whatever the case, I gave you the benefit of the, foul, be benefit of the doubt before I went to that extreme. Yeah. And nowadays, everything's recorded, man. So for my specific agency, anytime I go for a call for service or, or I'm interacting with the civilian population, I have to record. So at that point, that's evidence against you, man. So... You could see it. I'm like, I was acting friendly towards this person. I was trying to find out what was going on. He tried to hurt me or whatever the case is, and I had to use force to put him down. So that's what I mean by that, man. Yeah. A lot of people just, they can't see that, and they take it very personal. And you can't yeah. do that. Because once you start taking the job home, man, you're going to have a hard time, man. For me, it's like once I get home, unless something major happened, man, I'm going to forget about it, and I'm going to go to sleep, man. Yeah. Well, it's, especially now, and I, and I say post-COVID just because I always think about you know, what the pandemic would have been like if the George Floyd incident didn't happen. Because there's been tensions between the civilian population and law enforcement of any stretch, whether it's like your traditional uh, city police officer going all the way up to like maybe like the the federal agencies and mm -hmm. so forth. There's always been a tension there. Um, but looking at everything post-COVID, post that George Floyd incident where everything just got exploded, there were protests about police officers in the... like. United States police officers, there were protests for that overseas. Yeah. Which was insane. Which doesn't make sense, man. You know, <laughs> like, honestly, man, it's like, worry about your own problems. And that's where the, <laughs> you know, what kind of pisses me off, man, is that the U.S. is always meddling in other countries' affairs. And then what's kind of, the tables are turned on us. It's like, yes, we're supposed to lead by example, but we're not perfect, man. And yeah. you can't judge an entire agency or an entire law enforcement organization based on the actions of a sole individual or a group of indiv well, individuals. Well, that's, that's scary when that happens, right? Because when, because I've, I know a lot of police officers and I have not met personally, I have not met one single cop where I'm like, you know what? They would, they would 100% pull the same shit that the, uh, wasn't Derek Chau Chauvin, Chauvin. Mm -hmm. They would definitely do that. Like I've never met one cop. That ever gave me that impression, whether it's someone that I know personally yep. or just an interaction that I've had. And honestly, bro, you know, we're, we're trained whenever for that specific situation, he obviously he was under the influence for him to have his. And I don't want to speak out of out of terms, but for based on my observation, hindsight, 2020, you know, but we're not trained to put our knees on on the back of a person's neck for that long period of a time oh, there's no argument for that you know there's um no not sure argument. why he did it what he could have done obviously there was already three officers there if he still felt that he was fearful for his life or that he was going to be very belligerent if he were to let go of his neck then call for additional resources obviously they didn't do that um not sure if he has some type of personal issue against an individual or well that was the that was a rumor that i heard that they had actually known each other for a couple months before that they had a couple interactions but how crazy is that? That there were like three other officers that did nothing about it. Maybe it's just poor training or maybe they just were afraid to speak out. I'm not sure what their personal relationship is with one another. But yeah. for me and the way we're trained is that if I see you doing something fucked up, then I'm like, hey, man, I'm going to talk to you offline. I'm like, dude, don't do that again. Or, you know, there's a better way to go about it. Or basically what we do is that if I'm getting frustrated or I see an officer that's getting frustrated, I'm like, hey, man, let me tag in real quick. Kind of like a wrestling match. Hey, let me tag in. Let me see if I could kind of make some progress here, man, as opposed to you getting frustrated and then you're going to do something stupid. What's the point and of all the happen? officers involved are going to get some type of reprimand, man. So it's up to the individual and your buddies to kind of look out for each other, man. So I know. So I guess without obviously without naming the agency you're a part of, like, do you feel like there should be a bit, because the biggest argument that I've heard when it comes to what to do about policing in America, one of the biggest arguments is training, mm -hmm. right? Um, so there's obviously a police academy that every law enforcement officer goes through, but it's about that concurrent ongoing training. Um, I've heard arguments going from, let's we'll throw more money at it and let the, let the uh, agency directives do their job, or maybe even just get them into combatives training, have every police officer get to the level of like a purple belt in jiu-jitsu yeah. or something like that. There's a lot of different arguments. So but. the law enforcement academy, depending which agency you're going to, could be anywhere between 18 weeks, you know, six months, whatever the case is, yeah. man. Um, at that point, once you graduate, it's up to your 
you know, uh, your agency to do further training. Like for my agency, we have training pretty much every month. And it very and it goes from either, you know, doing uh, combatives, doing range time, doing, you know, crisis negotiation. You know, for me, I personally see it as diplomacy before war, man. If I can exhaust all options using my mouth, you know, talking to you before I need to do something to the extreme where I have to put you down by force, either just to restrain you or if I have to kind of, you know, we call it stopping the threat, stopping the threat. So if you pull a gun on me, man, and I have to smoke you, the political term is stopping the threat, okay? So don't say, you know, especially when you're being interviewed, oh, yeah, I smoked this dude, I killed this dude. No, it's basically you got to be politically ab- uh, correct about it. Yeah, I stopped the What's threat based on observations. Yeah, you have to be professional about it, man. Now, when you're talking to your buddies or whatever the case, and yeah, you can kind of, you know, deviate from that, you know, the way I'm speaking now, but... Yeah, every department has their own training. Now, how you know how they do it, you know, that's up to them, man. I ha- our department's pretty good when it comes to training, man, and um, we hardly get any complaints. You know, we try to do more customer service than anything else, and our record speaks for it, man. Yeah, no, and it's it's funny you say that because I've heard well the least amount of complaints out of your department specifically. Mm -hmm. Not that I'm in it by any means, because I could never do that fucking job. I know what kind of guy I am, and I just, I'm not built for that shit. Um, But do you feel like uh, you, learning that communicative skill, learning that de-escalation skill, do you feel like there is an adequate amount of training for that? Or is that something you could never get enough? So the academy only teaches you about a 40 hour block period of instruction on how to speak to individuals. And that's, you know, your crisis negotiation. Now, once you graduate, go to your law enforcement agency, it's up to them how often they want to do it. Maybe it's semi-annually or annually, man. Yeah. Um, so I can't really speak for every agency. Well, for you guys, but for do you us, feel like you get enough? Yes and no. And the reason I say that is because aside from dealing with the same individuals, you know, that are knuckleheads, you never know what this individual is going through or what crisis in their life they're in, man, or if they're under the influence. And maybe your verbal judo is not going to be enough to put, you know, to kind of help them out. And I just, put it. I just dealt with that situation this past week, man, and I'll get onto it, you know, here, here in a bit. But yeah, only verbal judo helps so much, man. And there's times where you have to use your force, man. And it's just yeah. part of the job, man. Well, that's an unfortunate side of policing that I feel like, like the more, whether it's privileged or detached or just virtue signaling part of America, they don't want to accept that if you have to police a situation, you have to police a person, it's not always a beautiful thing. It's always like, hey, stop committing crime. Oh, I'll stop committing crime. Like, <laughs> no, it's, hey, this guy, is he, he is armed or he is creating some sort of violent presence that we have to use violence to meet violence. Yeah. Do you feel like that's just an ugly fact that nobody wants to look at anymore? Uh, I just think that over the decades, man, policing has kind of given a, a, a bad rap to themselves, man. Just yeah. based on the on the actions of soul individuals, man. And it just kind of carries on throughout the decades. If you look at the civil rights movements, everything was African-Americans, Caucasians, etc., man. Policing has always been somewhat part of the variable when it comes to that, man. And it's just over the decades, it hasn't changed, man. It just seems like it's getting worse. Or maybe it's more prominent because of social media and the way that, you know, the, a political narrative attached to it. So yeah. to me, whenever I do speak to individuals, I'm like, hey, man, I don't know what your previous interactions were, man. But, you know, if you're cool with me, man, I, I'll be cool with you, man. It's very simple. Now, if you want to be a prick about it, then we're going to have issues. <laughs> and I'm not afraid to, you know, get down if I have to, man. And most of the times is nine times out of ten, I don't have to use force, man. 